good evening. Welcome to Space Oddities. Thank you for joining us on this Monday evening. We're a little depleted in numbers tonight, but never mind. After all, it's the middle of August, people are on holiday and doing other things. But I'd like to welcome the panel for this evening. I uh, especially like to welcome back Kareem, because uh, Kareem has not been able to join us in a while. So, uh, hi Kareem, how, how have you been? Hey Andy, uh, good. Uh, you know, you're talking about people still being on vacation, and our first day of classes was today. So, it's back to the grindstone. Back to the grindstone. Oh, well, all, all good things must come to an end, right? I honestly can't wait. I get to see my astronomy students for the first time tomorrow, and uh, uh, I'm looking forward to it. I hope they like you. <laughs> that that I have no control over. I no, just hope I, I, I get the jaws to drop a few times. That That's that's my goal. Who could fail to absolutely adore you, Kareem? Honestly. <laughs> but... There are I'll people. start taking names. I'll send them your way. <laughs> okay. All right. Also, like to welcome Daz in deepest Shropshire. How are you, Daz? Hello. Hello. Uh, same as usual. Clouded out, raining, uh, yeah. fed up. <laughs> <laughs> I caught. I caught one. One Perseid. One Perseid. That's all I managed to cap capture on the camera. But uh, yeah. So at least I saw them. Well, yes. I mean we. Uh... But, uh, we did. Uh, we did have a lovely Perseids peak night here. We sat out uh, on our balcony. We um, we don't normally go in the garden because uh, it's too full of mosquitoes. So we stay up on the balcony. But we have a good, a good view of the eastern sky, and we did see some lovely Perseids. And my daughter got to see them for the first time. So so that was fantastic. Oh, okay. Then what's the, does the mosquitoes suffer from vertigo? Yeah, absolutely. Then? Yeah, they do. They they don't like. Like, <laughs> stay on the grain no, no, no but um but no it was it was a really good night and uh and my daughter my daughter of course being a well she's 12 but she's going on 18 and she was getting bored of course after sitting doing nothing for 10 minutes except watching for meteors and what they failed to appear and then she said right universe if i, I don't see a perseid within the next two minutes i'm going back inside and immediately she said that this huge Perseid arced across the the northern sky. Uh, so she was she was really very really impressed that she can control the universe. But I'm going to sort of down down that <laughs> behavior. And, uh, Don't all yeah, teenagers yeah, think they control, control the control universe? Sort of thing, <laughs> uh, so there you are. Also, I'd like to welcome from deepest Somerset, Roger. How are you, Roger? I'm fine. Yeah. Well, as, as as usual, the skies have cleared for me, and I've been going absolutely hey hey well outside, going through the uh, using my narrow band filters, which you will see an example of later in the gallery. Fantastic! We will look forward to it. Thank you so much. Uh, so, to it. Uh, what's been happening? <clears throat> well, we're, I'm sure we were all saddened to hear of the loss of uh, Russia's Luna 25 spacecraft uh, in its attempt to land on the moon. Um, it was a sad day for everybody involved with the project, of course. Those scientists and engineers have been working on it for years and years. Uh, it was very, very tragic loss. Not altogether unexpected, uh, perhaps in light of the, uh, the terrible state that the Russian space program is in, in terms of funding. Um, but, uh, you know, still a terrible loss. Um, we wish all those scientists and engineers the best, obviously. I don't know what their plans will be now. Obviously, if anything they've got planned for the future will be delayed for a little bit while they hold an investigation and work out what happened. And there, there was one guy I was reading who's associated in some way with the Russian space program. He said, we need to learn how to design um, spacecraft all over again. Yeah. He said, we have to start from the bottom up, start again, basically. He said, because yeah, we're using literally. such old technology and everything has moved on. Uh, and that technology is no longer valid. So... We will see what happens. Yeah, because we were talking, Andy, before, if you remember, and uh, I was saying that it's it's been so over over delayed, delayed, over delayed, delayed, mm -hmm. um, that um, at one stage they actually scrapped all the um, software and they reverted back to software from other satellites and all that and piecemealed it together to try and get it to work properly. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it was a very sad day. Um, it's, I mean, because today it was supposed to be landed today and we planned to cover yeah. it, but, uh, yeah, we're you know, early to... night now. So, uh, yeah, but, uh, yeah, yeah hopefully, fingers yeah. crossed, I get something done. Yeah, but, you so, know, anyway, later in the program, um, I'm going to be doing a little bit of a special all about the Lunar South Pole. Why are so many countries in a race to get to the Lunar South Pole? 
why, uh, what are their plans, etc., etc., uh, and some background about the uh, the lunar South Pole itself. So we've got that coming up tonight. Kareem's also going to be talking to us about the blue moon, I believe. Kareem, is this correct? It is. I'm going to talk about the blue moon and the indigenous moons and try to connect a little bit of the wording that we use to describe this specific August full moon that's coming up. Right. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Uh, we, we call it here the curse of the blue moon, uh, Kareem, uh, because Daz has made, I think, two attempts to, uh, to do a presentation about the blue moon that have failed for technical reasons. So uh, we hope that yours goes smoothly. But let's not forget, this time around, it's a blue supermoon. So we've got Pete, I think, uh, <gasps> cursing us from the from afar. Oh, God, yeah. Blue supermoon. Yeah, because yeah, in the end, we territory. just dump mine on YouTube. So, yeah. <clears throat> yeah. You're on dangerous ground there, I tell you. Uh, and uh, we've got a uh, few things coming up in, in the program. Um, I'd like to, or we'd like to, obviously, thank everybody who bought us coffees last week. It was much appreciated, as always. Don't forget that uh, you can get your Space Oddities uh, merchandise. Uh, and I'll just quickly put up the, uh, the details. The details are in the description of the video. But just in case, here's your uh, Space Oddities t-shirts. Um, and you've never seen anything like them. They're the most unbelievable garment that's ever been uh, invented by anybody. Uh, they are a mere £19, including UK postage and packing. Please add £10 for foreign orders. And uh, you can get them by scanning that code there. But as I say, the details are in the description of the video. Or if you would prefer a hoodie, there's the Space Oddity hoodie. There are two designs, a zipper design and an over-the-head design. The over-the-head design has the uh, logo on the front. And the zipper one has it on the back, fairly logically. So those are available now. And uh, we hope that you like them because they're, they're really good. We're all wearing them. Well, no, Daz is not tonight. Um, they just... No, my partner has hit mine because I didn't take it off for three weeks. <laughs> <clears throat> so, <laughs> did, did she handle it with a pair of tongs? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so they, she, had, she had a hazmat suit on. <clears throat> so, yeah. uh, okay. Also, of course, if you would like to buy us a coffee, there's the code, as always, uh, to scan to, uh, to go and do that. And uh, your contributions are much appreciated because it helps us keep going and bring you even more amazing news about the universe. As Daz said, we had planned to cover the, the, the landing of Luna 25 on the moon today, but for obvious reasons, we can't do that. But on Wednesday, we will be covering the attempted landing of India's Chandrayaan-3 spacecraft on the moon and that's happening um around lunchtime we'll be going live um, uh, can somebody please look up and see if there's an exact timing for that because all i've seen are estimated times um and we'll hopefully give you an exact yeah. time but whatever time it is because it is happening during the daytime on wednesday we will bring it to you live on space oddity so keep your eyes out for that We'd love you to join us for the India's live landing on the moon. It'd be really great if they can pull it off this time after a few failures. So uh, hopefully you can join us on Wednesday for our live coverage of uh, India's attempt to land on the moon. It's right around uh, 1804 Indian Standard Time. 1804, right. Yes. 1804 Indian Time. Yeah. Uh, we'll have to convert that. So that'll be about two o'clock. Um... Anyway, they go live six, right yeah, around. Yeah, be about two o'clock our time then. Yeah, they go live so that, right around five thirty their time, so that'll be around one thirty your time and about uh, uh, yeah eight thirty my time, something like that. Yeah. Okay. Cool. All right then. Well, do keep an eye out for us on Wednesday if you can join us. It'd be fantastic to have your company to watch India land on the moon, and uh, this is going to be an interesting mission. It's a, it's a test of actually landing more than anything else, I think because India have got plans for the future, but they are going to be searching for um, ice in the, uh, in the um, regolith of the moon. So uh, that will be quite interesting. We'll talk more about ice on the moon a little later. Okay, I can't think of anything else we need to say before we get stuck into things. So as usual, uh, we will pass straight over to the man who is a legend in his own lunchtime, and that will be our Roger. Our hey. Roger, Roger, our kid. So, uh, so here we are. So let's just put your presentation up for you. Thank you. 
So here we are again for another week of uh, What's in the Night Sky for the 21st to the 27th of August. Coming up to the uh, August Bank Holiday, which will be the last one before the C word. Oh, um. don't. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, we're currently in a, a waxing crescent phase at the moment and this is what i managed to quickly grab last night i did try to get it earlier tonight but uh, the clouds that there were happened to keep going across the moon as opposed to the clear skies that were everywhere else around it but uh, there we go that's how it is and uh, some sunspot activity this is from a few days ago so uh, things might be picking up a bit more and uh, We'll see yeah. if there's any flares or anything going to be making their uh, appearance again. So we've got a first quarter on Thursday, so that should be uh, interesting. But at the moment, the moon's not getting too high up in the sky. So uh, when it does eventually get near the, uh, the blue, blue supermoon, <clears throat> which uh, will be later in the month, uh, we will have it uh, not too high up. So that will be not too much of an interference. Okay, so uh, obviously now we've uh, getting well into the latter stages of uh, August, we've got um, still got the um, central um, Brights area in Sagittarius of the galactic core and uh, we've got dominating overhead the uh, summer triangle so, but uh, as you can see i've got this set for 10 o'clock and as you can see saturn is uh, making a more impressive imp appearance now uh, earlier in the evening so uh, all well and good there okay so what well, that's that and then uh, four hours later we've got uh, jupiter up in the night sky which is uh, just leading uh, Taurus up out of the uh, oh, eastern yes. skies. Yes, I saw it the other night. Ooh, yes. Winter's so, coming. Yes, Pleiades and the Hades and all that. So uh, things are uh, heading towards the winter constellations at the moment, but uh, we won't dwell on that too much. <laughs> no. No, but uh, as you can see, uh, they are starting to make an appearance in the... Uh, earlier hours so the gallery and Perfect. we've got quite a few here to catch up from uh, earlier on so uh, strap in and have a look at some of these right the first one we've got is from lee in uh, down in uh, cornwall and uh, this is an image that he's managed to get of jupiter uh -huh. there's rather a lot there to work through so uh, just having a nightmare trying to get Jupiter or Saturn on with his camera and his two times Barlow. So uh, this is what we've got. Oh, nice one, Lee. Hmm, oh, nice. that's pretty good. And he's marked <laughs> out Europa and Io on there as well. So, uh, and he's got Ganymede, uh, Ganymede in transit by the look of it as well. Hmm. I think there might that might be the red spot there, possibly on the uh, yeah, might be. on the lower part there. So, uh, well done. Well Very done, good. Lee. Another winner. Yes. <laughs> right, we've got another one. Uh, our regular entry from Jerry Delay of the Witch's Hi, Brew. Hope you're well. And uh, this is with his S300 D and his Alex String with the ISR Pro processed in Pixinsight and Photoshop. And here we are. Some nice That's colors beautiful. there. Lovely. Very good. One of my favorite Halloween deep sky objects. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. Look at that. Yeah. Isn't that Very lovely colors? And then we've got one from Johnny and Rachel, the Crescent Nebula. So uh, we've got three hours of HA and three hours of O2. So that's with the uh, Optolong filter with his William Optics FLT 132. So they're just trying to uh, get some more sulfur to complete a, a SHO pallet. But this is what we've got so far. Oh, oh my. How cool is that? Fantastic. That is pretty cool. It's incredible. The, the brain. The brain. Yeah. The brain. The brain. The brain. It just pops out. 
it's, certainly it's, does. It's, wow. That is incredible. Very nice. Not only, but they've also uh, submitted a second image, which uh, they've made a start with on uh, on the HA. So they've got the other two uh, narrow band filters to add. And uh, this is SH2171. Uh, it says, I always call this the whale tail. Can you spot it? And this <laughs> is what they've got. Hmm. I'm still trying to find where the whale tail is. Hmm. We're going to have very good, very good so far. Yeah. Ha ha. Ha ha. There we go then. Right. And one from Kevin. Oh, look, it's a solar image. And uh, <laughs> well, he's Kevin. processed this slightly <clears throat> differently this time. So we can see the wispy tails of the. Uh, Prominence is up against the background, which will I will now show you. Oh, lovely! Look at that! Oh, wow! Mm. This, this is yeah. The sun. Uh, sorry, yeah. The sun has been quite active the last few days. I must admit, there's been some big um, flares and uh, active mm. regions going kicking off. So uh, yeah, yeah. But putting it against that's, the that's really. Putting it against the white background yeah. is just phenomenal. That is. Isn't it? Isn't it? Mm. Just? Well done, Kev. That's, that, that, yeah, that's obviously... How'd you do that? Get a bigger sun behind? <laughs> stunning. <laughs> Absolutely stunning. Hmm. Right then. Oh, no. Here we go. Huh. <laughs> right. <laughs> now, you've seen, you've seen this as, a, as an ongoing saga. But now I finally managed to put it all together. So this is a first SHO with 14 and a half hours integration time with my little red cat. And I'm rather pleased with this one. So without further ado. Da, da, da. Oh, beautiful. beautiful. Wow. You must be happy with that, Rog. I'm very happy. I think I'm going to get another metal print done, and I'm going to have that. I would. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> Did you say this one's 14? Your house is going to be armor-plated. <laughs> <laughs> how, how many hours of integration time was this? Four, 14 and a half. So if you have Bortle 900 skies like I do, how, how much do I need for this? Oh, probably 10, 20 times that then. Years, 20, 10 incredible. or 20 years. Oh, wow. Uh, <laughs> That's now, I posted point. this on Twitter, stroke X, and uh, a gentleman called Kevin Earp made a, a comment about something that was in my picture. Okay. So ah, he posted the say, you captured the dark emu nebula as well, too. And where's, where's oh, the cool. Wolfhound nebula? Mm. Is that new? Well, he, he, he can see an emu in that, but I can see uh, like a monkey, which is sort of facing down. I can see the and emu. And the head of the emu is the leg of the monkey. I can yep. see the emu. I, the first thing I, can I see saw both. was the emu. Yeah. I see the monkey as well now, but I see the emu as well. Yeah, you can see here. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be like those Aradilio. dresses different colors depending on how you look at it, right? This is yeah. either a monkey or an emu. We should put mm. up a Twitter poll. We should put up a Twitter poll from Space Oddities. That's yeah. Is this idea. a monkey or is this an emu? Mm. But it doesn't have an actual designation, but uh, Kevin's decided to uh, call it one himself. So uh, perhaps we ought to uh, put it into the International Astronomy Union or whatever to say, yeah. can this be designated as this... Um, as this um, image, yeah. Well, so, well say, say, say to them, Emu Nebula or Monkey Nebula, your choice. Which is it? And yeah. let them decide. Mm. See, Steve is playing the uh, both sides of the coin. He sees a monkey mew. <laughs> 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 yeah. Um, I mean, going back to um, back to uh, the previous image, I haven't done anything apart from colorize it. I haven't brought any contrast or anything into it so uh i've just left it like that really it's an so. amazing image rush mm. yeah it's, it's quite uh, interesting to get the detail in the actual uh, the uh, elephant's trunk there but yeah uh, anyway 
there we go let's move on i bet it looks great on a huge screen as well mm. so at the moment there's uh there's this uh announcement of a forthcoming comet uh c stroke 23 p1 nashimura which apparently could be uh almost uh naked eye visibility in the next month's time so uh we'll have to keep an eye out for that uh, if it can uh, continue to uh not be destroyed by its orbit around the sun so uh hopefully it might might be visible well keep us posted on that much okay Ooh. and uh it's currently uh just south of uh, gemini at the moment but uh if you want to see it you'll have to see it in the wee hours of the morning oh, uh, this, nice. is, nice this is a quick this is a, a current image of the comet at the moment so it's not uh too bad it's got quite a long thin tail to uh yeah to, uh, but a very big um um gaseous head at there at the moment so uh yeah, we shall see. Fantastic. I was reading that the naked eye times is going to be so close to uh, to the mm. sun that it might be visible a bit from the southern hemisphere of the yeah. equatorial region. Now, I've got this um, um, where it is currently, but at half past four in the morning. But I don't know whether the twilight might uh, knock, knock the visibility of it out a bit too much. But uh, we, can, we can have a look and see if it's going to... Uh, be visible from uh, from our location at the moment but right. um, it's still still a bit low down on the ground to uh, to, to get a chance of uh, being able to see it but if you can see it all well and good um just to, just to interrupt rog i see yes. everyone's playing the game now with paradilio um the so uh, harold says uh, the the emu image actually looks like the gremlin from the twilight zone i think he's i assume he's talking about the um the shatner uh, episode where he's on a plane yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> astro, astro nebuli says it's like the uh, beast of bodmin um <laughs> somebody said they could oh facebook user says they can see a running man i actually saw the running man as well mm. um on this side um so yeah they're all playing the game now so uh They'll all be out, out uh, trying to pick, pick, get some more names for these mystery uh, dark mm. patches in the sky. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, yeah. right. Yeah. Well, that's that's what I've got to show. But I've got some news here about NASA's Ingenuity's helicopter. Do it tell. has this in the last few days completed a fifty-fifth flight, and uh, it Woo has fifty-five. Yeah. And it uh, has uh, traveled 866 feet, 264 meters, at a height of 10 meters, and it took that distance in 143 seconds. That, so that, not only has it had 55 flights, it's now covered a total of 12 and a half kilometers above the Martian surface since it uh, initially, initially um, took off back in two years ago so well, um, it's been absolutely amazing what can you say what, what amazing say? engineering mm. uh Is kev any... says in the chat sorry uh thanks for the nice comments oddies uh, i shall try and not submit sun pics for a while but then oh, steve God. warby says please carry on kevin it's the only vitamin d i get so <laughs> <laughs> oh dear <laughs> nice one steve <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, lovely, lovely. Have we got another one here? Uh, running man on a treadmill. That's another one. Submitted <laughs> <laughs> uh, so oh, by uh, somebody on Facebook, I think. By the mm. And mm. I do apologize if you're watching us on Facebook uh, because uh, this software and Facebook don't really talk to each other that well. Uh, it doesn't pull your name across, so you just appear in the chat as a bit bit formally as facebook user so uh, apologies for that but if you yeah, want andy put, andy what if that's the real name in. sorry what if that's the real name um yes <laughs> yes <laughs> i should ignore that and just carry on basically okay. um, <laughs> and, um, 
so there we are but if you do want you know if you are posting from facebook put your name in the chat as well so in your message so we know who who it is so that we can address you informally mm. so uh, so there we are right okay is that it then roger that's it for me i'm afraid okay cool right there we are then so thank Great. you roger. that was a good gallery i enjoyed that mm. yeah thanks thanks for the yeah. gallery guys as ever we are stunned by the professional quality of your your images and you know i mean that one of the elephant's trunk roger i couldn't tell the distance between that and one but taken by a huge with a huge telescope i mean you know this is getting to be the the narrowing isn't it of amateur and professional astrophotography i mean that was taken with a red cat 51 for goodness sake ah, that's amazing i've no idea what that is but it sounds amazing you know so, a 51 uh, inch a 51 <laughs> millimeter run refractor one inch. Yeah, it, ooh, inch. the world's biggest refractor yeah <laughs> in my garden oh well, look at me i'm <laughs> humble little roger sitting at home in sparkford in this tiny little place with really tiny equipment but i have got a 51 inch refractor <laughs> 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 um, you're, you're too modest sir. i know yeah so um so yeah so so there we are so keep them coming guys um, whether they're of the sun or not, Kev, of course we love your solar images. You, you submit them whenever you want to. So, um, yes, and you can email all your gallery entries, of course, to spacequalitieslive at gmail.com. And, uh, and uh, one entry per email, please, if you could mark your emails, um, uh, a gallery entry or something like that, that would be much appreciated so we can find them easily. Okay, moving on, moving on. Um, what have we got next? Well, I've got some news for you this week, and uh, there's not. There's been a bit of a slow news week, to be quite honest. But there are a few things, including an update of one of the stories from from last week. So let's just try and put this up on the screen, and uh, let me just uh, ha let me just uh, warp into uh, or transport myself into the uh, the news. So uh, news for the 21st of August, and the first thing is. Um, uh, an update on the dark matter story from last week. Now, if you were with us last week, even if you weren't, you've probably seen it in the news that there's been this major story about possibly our first evidence for gravity performing in a non-Newtonian manner using Gaia data to look at uh, types of star systems called wide binaries where the acceleration between the two stars in the binary is very, very low and uh, in actual fact, the acceleration has turned out to be 30% or 40% faster than what is predicted by Newton uh, and indeed Einsteinian gravity. Now, uh, Professor H. K. Uh, K. H. Che of Seoul in South Korea released a paper. He'd made this discovery with his colleagues that the acceleration between the so-called wide binary stars is 30 to 40% more. Than, uh, than it should be according to Newtonian gravity. It fits in well with the prediction of uh, MOND or uh, modified Newtonian dynamics. It fits in exactly with uh, one version of, um, of MOND and uh, called AQUAL. And uh, that was the story last week. Anyway, just to recap. Well, um, the um, interesting thing is another team of scientists have released a paper using exactly the same data and whereas uh, professor che and his colleagues uh, got a five uh, sigma level of certainty in their results uh, this team have got a 16 sigma degree of certainty which means it's pretty damn certain that this is the case but unfortunately uh, their analysis has a 16 sigma degree of certainty that the data does not contradict Newtonian gravity. So uh, this is uh, really strange. Nobody knows what it means because in both cases, both teams agree that the data they're using from Gaia, the, uh, the European um, satellite that's orbiting out at uh, L2, uh, mapping one billion stars in the Milky Way galaxy, they agree that the data is accurate. But when they actually try and work out what it means, they get completely different results. So what does all it mean? Well, we don't know what it all means. It could, it could be the case that we need much longer studies to study uh, these sort of uh, really low accelerations in wide binary systems. Instead of just having one or two years data, we may need 10 years data. 
uh, to establish trends and things like this. Nobody's quite sure what all this means at the moment. So at the moment, Newtonian gravity stands, but um, there's no explanation for what Professor Che and his colleagues found either. So it's all a bit up in the air. We've got to await further studies to verify uh, one or the other. But it's very interesting, and of course, we'll keep you up to date. So that's that. Um, interesting story. Humans have managed to tilt the Earth's axis. I don't know whether you saw this. This is actually from a few weeks ago. And basically what's happened is that um, we have been extracting um, so much groundwater from underground aquifers that we've managed to tilt the Earth's axis by 31 and a half inches. And uh, the amount of uh, ac uh, water that we've extracted between uh, 1993 and 2010 is 2,150 gigatons of water, which is the equivalent of 860 million Olympic swimming pools. Most of that water ends up in the ocean. And that has been uh, redistributing the mass in the Earth's oceans. And this has had the effect of tilting the Earth's axis over by 31 and a half inches. So basically, we, uh, we've tipped the Earth over uh, a little bit by extracting all this water, which is a bit worrying, really, and a bit concerning when you think about it. But it's, you know, it's still amazing that humans uh, can actually have an effect on tilting the axis of the Earth. We're pretty destructive uh, animals when it comes down to it, aren't we? So, so there we are. So that was that story. Uh, another one, the James Webb Space Telescope, to everybody's surprise, has discovered far more supermassive black holes in the early universe than, uh, than had been theorized. So looking at these early galaxies in the uh, early universe, uh, the ones you're seeing, they are all what we call active galactic nuclei, which are powered by quasars. And they are far more plentiful early on in the universe than scientists had theorized could be possible. So there's obviously something going on there that we, we don't know about. But that's what the telescope is there for. It's there to show us things that we didn't know about or that we have to rethink. We have to rethink our theories. But in any event, there's a much bigger population of um, supermassive black holes in the early universe uh, than, uh, than we had theorized up to now. So there you are. So that is the, uh, that's the news uh, for, for, for this week. And I uh, hope you enjoyed that. Bit of a slow week. Yeah, a bit of a slow week for news, but uh, but there we are. So well, it's a bit of a slow week because we talked about Luna at the start, and Chandrayaan three still hasn't uh, happened yet. But no, that's, that's going right. to be centering the news for that's us. That's right. That's right. Uh, so um, yeah, I don't know whether you've been storing the, following the story of the um, the Newtonian gravity thing with the Gaia data, uh, Kareem. I have. Um, it's. And it's as it's so maddening because we always get this with Mond against dark matter that we have one set of results that points one way and then we get another set that points completely the other way. And it's it's so frustrating. We don't seem to be making any real progress with it at all. Well, a lot of it is, and I, and I tried reading uh, the first paper a little bit, and one of the things that I found frustrating was they're very vague on what assumptions they've made in characterizing the, the orbital trajectories and where they're putting in their error bars from. And the right. Gaia data is very rough that way where, depending on how you look at it, you can get a measurement from data point to data point. But yeah. if the telescope is skewing one way when it takes the first data set and another way when it takes the other data set, you can have error bars that aren't being interpreted the right way. Right, right. Okay. Uh, yeah, well, we'll just have to wait and see, won't we? Yeah, uh, no, definitely. And this is where it's really valuable to get as many of the active research groups to analyze the data in a way that's consistent to how they analyze other data to see whether the the decisions are made, whether the conclusions are made mm -hmm. in a reliable fashion. This is where peer-reviewed research, it's very bad to publish right away, but these days with all the stresses on research groups, you want to get your conclusions out there right away, and then you might retract later if somebody else points something out that you've missed, but you want to be the first one to say it. Sure, sure. What I found interesting, though, was that Professor Che has always been a big advocate of, uh, of dark matter, 
Mm-hmm. And he's with this latest data that, uh, or his interpretation of the data, that he seems to have changed his mind. So you know, he seems to have been convinced by it, certainly. So um, I don't know. We'll just have to wait and see. Well, as regards your story about the uh, tilt of the Earth, mm. Steve says, as I said the other week, Manchester's rainfall might tip the Earth back. <laughs> so obviously they've been having a bit of, bit of a deluge. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's very, very true. And of course, uh, our rainfall here is um, is 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 not going to do anything. So, Uh, so. Andy, uh, Jack Martin was asking about the difference in sigma values, and Graham asked how many sigmas before you could reliably use the words definite. Um, Is that something you want to tackle? Um, Well, it it varies, doesn't it, depending on the scientific discipline. For example, in nuclear physics, you're looking for a a five sigma uh, level of certainty. In astronomy, usually four sigma is required. So it, it does vary depending on the discipline. But basically, in nuclear physics, certainly, anything that is phi sigma or more, you can say is pretty much definite. Uh, if it's 16 sigma, like this team claim, then it's, um, it's <laughs> definitely definite. Um, but it's definitely definite yeah. based on whatever assumptions you've used or whatever characterization yeah. you've used for the data. And yeah. the sigma itself is basically the standard deviation from the mean of the data point. So you're basically looking at how far away from what would be considered to be the standard result are you? Yeah, 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 definitely. Uh, Welcome, Alan. Alan says, uh, managed to get on YouTube eventually. So welcome, Alan, you've just joined us. Uh, Yes, so um, 16 Sigma, though, is a pretty high level of certainty. Um, It's not often you see that banded around. So, so uh, you know, this is this is really, you know, people saying we're really, 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 really sure about this. And no, we are honestly. No, 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 honestly, it, this is definitely definite. So, um, <laughs> you know, honestly, no, trust us. It's really. a miracle. It's a miracle. <laughs> yeah, it's a mystery. It's the mystery. Anyway, uh, so um, Graham says, oh yeah, Graham says that helped. I first heard the sigma term in terms of uh, Higgs boson. Uh, I wonder what it meant. So yeah, it's it's just a way of expressing, as as Kareem said, how far away it is from a sort of a normal occurrence, if you like. Uh, yeah. so, and the Higgs boson worked out well, didn't it? Well, that, yeah, eventually, but um, but yeah, uh, <laughs> you need you need corroborating data, and that's the thing is you need to be able to identify these types of markers again and again before you can make any reliable. You know, Richard Feynman used to say that in in science, you know, it's very the the best thing you can do in science is to say that you've disproved something. You can never prove something. You can get yeah. results that are in confirmation with the with the theory that you think is right but you can't say that now that means that your theory has to be right it's right no. to it's it's consistent with your results that's as best as you can say that's right that's right. and wasn't it Feynman who also said um, science doesn't deal in proofs proof is reserved for mathematics and alcohol um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so but it, he's absolutely right isn't he because in science you never really prove anything you just get an indication, and uh, and your results can be superseded at any time. So, uh, so there we are. I guess the question that lingers from Feynman is, which gets you into more trouble, mathematics or alcohol? <laughs> Speaking personally, um, mathematics. <laughs> uh, anyway, so there we are. Okay, um, now Kareem, tell us about the blue moon then. Sure. Let me just uh, share my screen here and uh, we can walk through a little bit of what's happening here in August with this beautiful blue moon, full moon, super moon that's coming our way. Mm -hmm. This is part of the approach that uh, I share in my outreach with Two-Eyed Seeing, which is trying to connect the strengths of indigenous and ancient knowledge with the way in which we see things with the modern scientific knowledge and trying to connect them as best as possible. So whenever we do our Montreal Center public events or outreach, we always talk about our land acknowledgement as well as our sky acknowledgement. Our land acknowledgement, most of the settled areas here in the colonies uh, and for us here in Montreal, we are an unceded indigenous lands. 
but we also share the sky with all the First Nations. So whatever we're observing, whatever we're seeing, we're not the first ones to see it typically. We're not the first ones to try to understand it or to capture it in some fashion. The easiest place to look at that is the moons and the lunar months and the way in which we call the moons in different cultures based on what we see happening in nature. So our early August full moon was called the berry ripening moon. And the current full moon that's coming up in about a week and a bit is also going to be referred to as the berry ripening moon by a lot of the Mi'kmaq tribes because it's kind of the redux. It's the repeat. It's the bringing it back because what we see happening in nature from the start of August to the end of August doesn't really seem to have changed very much. Now, we're not there yet. Right now, we're still at a waxing crescent phase. And thankfully, Roger gets these beautiful pictures because he actually has skies he can look at. And we can keep an eye on the phase as it's growing and start to see if anything in nature does change. But this reference to the berry ripening moon a second time by the Mi'kmaq people is something that a lot of the First Nations do. So um, for here near the Great Lakes, we also refer to it as a grain moon or a barley moon. But when we look at it in the almanac or in any of the literature, we, we hear the August full moons referred to as the sturgeon moons. And in specific, the current farmer's almanac refers to the first of the full moons as the full sturgeon moon and the second one as a full blue moon. So I wanted to talk a little bit about what a blue moon was, but I want to mention what the sturgeon moon is because this really struck me. When I tried to look up references in Europe for how they're referring to the full moons of August, they all referred to it with sturgeon moon. And the sturgeon is a fantastic fish we catch here in the Great Lakes in North America. It's plentiful in August, and it has been around with an almost unchanged DNA for 135 million years. So when you're eating sturgeon, you're eating the same fish that the first humans ate, the same delicacy. You're getting pretty much the same taste, except, you know, yeah, the water has more pollutants. But, you know, otherwise, mm -hmm. it's the same mm -hmm. fish. But... I didn't understand why in British culture or in German culture, they would also be referring to it as the sturgeon moon because it has no connection there. But we're, we're not quite at the harvest moon yet, right? The harvest moon is the next moon coming. And it turns out that the names of the moons have really been dominated by what is referred to in the middle of the U.S. And that seems to have pervaded pretty much all of the way in which moons are referred to across the uh, even across the pond here so when we refer to it as a bull as a blue moon it's important to recognize this isn't the traditional blue moon the traditional blue moon is a seasonal blue moon and it's the third full bloom full moon in a season with four full moons now i've seen it written this way in some of the literature where they call this one a seasonal blue moon it's not because the next full moon is happening after the autumnal equinox. So it's happening when we're already into fall. So why was a blue moon ever referred to in terms of this seasonal approach rather than the way we seem to see it now, which is two full moons in the same calendar month? Right. And it's because the Christian ecclesiastical calendar wanted to evade the idea of 13 because 13 was considered unlucky even all the way back then. So they didn't want to talk about 13 full moons. And it turned out that the first time they looked at this in the calendar was when the blue moon was falling during the winter season. And in the winter season, the last full moon is called the Lenten moon. And the first spring full moon is our Paschal moon. It's when Easter happens. Right. So if you name the third blue moon of a season as a blue moon, Lent still happens right before the spring equinox. And Lent and Easter can coincide at the right moon phases with celebrations and customs around them falling at the right time. Ah, so the blue moons traditionally were these seasonal ones. And it turns out that the only reason they're referred to differently now is because of a mistake that was made in Sky and Telescope magazine in 1946 by an amateur astronomer who misinterpreted the blue moon as the second full moon in a calendar month. Now, 40 years later, that definition found its way into Trivial Pursuit. And that's it. Now it's part of pop culture, where the blue moon is a calendar blue moon. Where if any calendar, in the, if any month in the Julian calendar has two full moons, we refer to the second one as a blue moon. 
I found that absolutely hysterical that that's the way in which this misinterpretation now becomes common definition. Amazing. Now, well, where did the idea of a blue moon come from? Well, it's the fact that you have this rare occurrence that seems rare, but it actually occurs a couple of times every three years. And it's because of the way in which the lunar months don't exactly fit in to an integer number within our year. Mm -hmm. So let me explain for a moment. Our moon's orbit takes 27.3 days to revolve around the Earth once. The orbit is a bit tilted and it's elliptical, which means that sometimes the moon is a little bit closer, sometimes the moon is a little bit further away. And that also gives rise to this idea of a supermoon versus a micromoon. So right now, coming up on Thursday, August 31st for everybody in Europe, but on Wednesday night, August 30th, for those of us in North America, we will have a super full moon where the moon is at a distance of 357,000 some odd kilometers. That's closer than when it's at its furthest point, which is 406,000 kilometers almost. So it will appear just a little bit larger. And this month in particular, we actually have a supermoon at the start of August and a supermoon at the end of the same calendar month. The two full supermoons in the same calendar month doesn't happen often. It happened five years ago, and the next time it'll happen is in 14 years, in 2037. So this elliptical orbit sometimes it's closer sometimes it's further away the orbit itself processes a little bit it means that the size of the full moon changes a little bit in your perception the moon itself doesn't change the moon itself is the same moon that we look at all the time but because the phases of the moon don't repeat in that same cycle they actually take 29.5 days to repeat is why we talk about a lunar month not in the revolution of the moon around the earth but in the repeating from new moon to new moon or from full moon to full moon so one of the questions my students always ask me is wait so if it's 27.3 days for one revolution why is it 29.5 days for an actual lunar month and if we picture what's happening with the earth is over the span of those 20 some odd days the earth has continued to move in its orbit around the sun which means that when we look at the points where we had a new moon in the previous month and where the moon would have completed one full revolution around the Earth, that geometry is not a new moon. It's still a waning crescent. And we have to go a little bit further, another 2.2 days before we reach that same syzygy where the Earth, the moon, and the sun create that new moon orientation, that new moon phase. So we have 29.5 days in a lunar month, and that's not an integer number of months in 365 and a quarter days of the year. So now we look back to indigenous knowledge to try to understand where the 13th lunar month comes from. And in a lot of our North American uh, lunar mythology, we actually have the turtle that carries the humans here on Turtle Island. And its pictures are broken up into 13 large scales on the, on, the, on the shell of that turtle. And that stands for the 13 lunar months. There's also 28 smaller that, depending on where you read them, they either refer to the idea that 28 by 13 is almost a full year, and then you have a couple of days to rest, or what one of the Mi'kmaq elders was telling me is that there's only 28 full daytime cycles in any lunar month that you can count on. So you have 28 days to get your work done during each lunar month because the nights are when the lunar month typically will change over from one to another. So in the Mi'kmaq culture, what they look at is there's a set of the older elders, the ones who are from the Acadia First Nations, for example, that have a different name for this 13th moon month. They call it uh, Aguidagus. And Aguidagus is the halfway moon. So if you start with the very first full moon after the spring equinox, after the vernal equinox, which we call the maple sugar moon, because that's when you can tap, tap the trees for that sweet maple sugar that I love and a lot of us here in North America love, especially on our pancakes and waffles. From that maple sugar moon, you have six full moons that have already passed, with the sixth one being at the start of August with the berry ripening moon. Because we have this extra full moon during this particular year, 
if we call it this halfway moon, after that, there are six more full moons before the next spring equinox. So Agurgus is the middle moon of the 13 moons or the halfway moon. So for them, it's not a question of a blue moon. It's a question of an extra moon in the cycle halfway through that allows you to ensure that when you're calling the moon by what's happening in nature, rather than trying to repeat something that's already in transition, you're simply bringing in this halfway moon to remind yourself that this year you have this extra wonderful lunar cycle there for you. So that's it about the blue moon. Thank you. And voila, Liok. Uh, I Thank hope you. That that's uh, that's amazing, Corinne. Uh, it's something that's quite mind bending, really. It takes a bit to get, get your head around it, doesn't it? Yeah. Mm. Uh, Derek was asking about the world sitting on the back of a turtle. That's uh, that's actually another uh, whole legend, and uh, Discworld is is wonderful for that, where it's the the world on the turtle on top of four elephants swimming through the sea, which I which I absolutely adore. It's Terry turtles Pratchett all the way down, down there. It's turtles yeah. all the way down. Because yeah. also Jack mentions that uh, it seems like the Jewish um, religious calendar is run by the full moons as well. So uh, exactly. Oh, very interesting. As, as is the Persian oh, calendar Green, with the Muslims so as well. Thank you so much. My pleasure. That's wonderful. Well, we're going to stay with the moon now, um, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about the race for the South Pole. Da, da, da. So let me just uh, get down and dirty with this, and um, here we are. So the race of the lunar South Pole, as we said earlier, the, the loss of the Russian Luna 25 spacecraft the current race between India and Russia is now obviously not on anymore. But there's a lot going on with the Lunar South Pole that you might not be aware of. So let's have a look. We'll start by having a look at the actual topology of the Lunar South Pole. And this is a beautiful image of the Lunar South Pole taken by the uh, Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. Um, extremely haunting, really weird landscape. Uh, but let's talk about it. So this is the topology of, of the moon, basically. We've got the near side and we've got the far side. The South Pole is characterized by uh, huge craters, very deep ones, uh, with ridges between their rims and just on the far side of the moon and therefore invisible most of the time from us is this big uh, blotch here called the Aitken Basin, which is either one of or it's the biggest impact site in the solar system, a massive impact on the moon. And we get to see uh, a little bit of it um, when uh, occasionally when, when we can see a little bit of the far side of the moon. But um, as you can see, the near side characterized by a lot of craters and quite mountainous uh, terrain. Now, the actual lunar south pole is in a, in a very um, not obvious position. This is looking at the area of the Lunar South Pole. And the Lunar South Pole is actually exactly here on the rim of a crater called Shackleton, named after uh, Ernest Shackleton, of course, the famous British explorer. And uh, it's the Lunar South Pole is exactly there, literally on the rim of the crater. And the Shackleton crater is 21 kilometers wide by 4.7 kilometers deep. But we've got some bigger ones around it. We've got Hayworth, for example, 51 kilometers, uh, its depth unknown. Um, we've got Shoemaker, named after, of course, uh, the famous um, scientist, Eugene Shoemaker, and um, 50 kilometers wide by two and a half kilometers deep. Faustini, 39 kilometers wide, depth unknown. Uh, De Gale Lash, 32 kilometers wide and, and depth unknown. So you've got some pretty, um, pretty wide craters here and some very deep ones. And you can see the ridges here between the, uh, between the craters and uh, making the whole landscape look really sort of mountainous and big. Now, interestingly, a lot of these craters are in permanent shadow. The sunlight never penetrates them, never illuminates them. Why would that be? I work in the Scientific Visualization Studio at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center. We're looking at a computer model of the view of the South Pole of the Moon. This is like a time lapse to show the motion of the sun and the Earth and how the shadows change over time. Things don't rise and set in the usual way here. The sun travels around the horizon, never getting more than a degree and a half of the way. So they're almost like 
of shadows. And from here, the Earth appears to be upside down and rotating backwards, but that's just because of our point of view. The Earth doesn't move much in the moon sky. It's always in roughly the same place, just sort of bobbing around. That's true everywhere on the near side of the moon. It's a consequence of the moon always pointing the same place toward the Earth. It takes about a month for the sun to make a complete circuit around the horizon, and every so often, it'll pass behind the Earth, creating an eclipse. I've slowed down time here a little so that it's easier to see. On Earth, that would be a total lunar eclipse, the moon passing through the shadow cast by the Earth. But if you're standing on the moon, it's an eclipse of the sun. The terrain at the South Pole is especially rugged. The rim of Shackleton Crater is in the foreground here, and the mountain off on the horizon, unofficially known as Mount Alfred, is about 85 miles away. Shackleton Crater is about 13 miles wide, not quite as wide as the Grand Canyon, but it's twice as deep. The sunlight never reaches the crater floor, so temperatures there are around 300 degrees below zero Fahrenheit. This model of the terrain is made possible by Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter which has been mapping the surface of the moon from lunar orbit since 2009. LRO's maps will be incredibly important for exploring the moon and locating water and other resources there. So there you are. Um, that's, uh, that's the topology of the south pole of the moon. Imagine these craters never having seen sunlight in billions of years. And this brings us to the topic of, believe it or not, water, because a lot of water has been discovered not just the South Pole, but um, at the North Pole of the Moon as well. Now, these are just some of the spacecraft that have detected it. Lunar Perspective, I think, was the first in 1998, and it detected a possible 300 million tons of water at each pole, so 600 million in total. Then we've got Clementine in 1994, detected water at both poles. Chandrayaan-1, the predecessor of Chandrayaan-3, uh, which is uh, hopefully going to land on the moon on Wednesday, uh, was an impact mission to slam an impact into the moon, and it detected water ice near Shackleton Crater. The Elcross mission from NASA, again, another impactor, uh, detected water ice near Cabeus Crater, another crater at the south pole of the moon. The deep impact mission, you may remember, uh, to uh, NASA's wonderful mission to ram a probe uh, or an impactor into an asteroid, and um, that was in 2009. But on its way to the asteroid, it, it bypassed the moon, and it actually detected water vapor in the moon's atmosphere. And if you're going to turn around and say that the moon hasn't got an atmosphere, well, yes, it has. It's just a very, very thin one. But uh, the deep impact mission detected water vapor in that atmosphere. And Chang'e 5, you may remember, I think I reported on this a couple of weeks ago, that uh, around impact sites on the moon, around craters, in other words, it found all these glass beads laying about on the surface that were full of water. So there may be um, a huge amount of water locked up in those glass beads around craters on, just on the surface of the moon. So these were all momentous discoveries. Now, uh, the NASA flying observatory, SOFIA, which, uh, as you may know, was in a, a modified 747, uh, an infrared telescope, looked at the south pole of the moon, and this is what it saw. And uh, you can see here that this is basically telling us that this is water and lots of it at the lunar south pole. So this is all very exciting. Now, if you can get at that water, well, what does it do for you? What would you use it for? Well, astronauts would use it for all sorts of things, but they would use it, obviously, to survive uh, for life support. They would use it for hydroponics to grow plants on the moon. And um, they would use it for rocket fuel because you can split the water into oxygen and hydrogen and make rocket fuel out of it. And, of course, they would use it for research, general research about the moon. But there would be a lot of other things, I'm sure, that people would think of as well. So it's very, very interesting. Um, where does the moon's water come from? Well, a few possible places. Comets and asteroids is obviously one, but the solar wind is another because the charged particles from the sun interact with uh, the lunar surface and can create water molecules, believe it or not. And um, it can also um, be uh, from the Earth itself because don't forget we believe that the moon 
was formed after a Mars-sized body collided with the Earth early in its history, and a huge amount of the Earth's crust was thrown into space and then coalesced quite quickly, as it turns out, to form the Moon, while the water could have come from the Earth in that way. We don't know, basically, is the answer. But then again, we don't really know where Earth's water came from in the first place. So uh, so there we are. So that's a bit uncertain at the moment. So a few possible origins for that water from the moon. But I think a lot of it primarily will come from comets and asteroids. Now, how do we get there? Well, actually, as Luna 25 found out this week, landing on the moon's south pole or the north pole, come to that, is not easy. But actually landing on the moon generally is not easy. 50% of all attempted landings on the moon have failed. And you may know that that's exactly the same failure rate as Mars, funnily enough, in a weird cosmic coincidence. So what you have to do, you have to put your spacecraft into a normal, uh, inverted commas, orbit around the moon, a non-polar orbit, and then over time slowly change its orbit so that it becomes a polar orbit. Sounds easy, but actually it's quite complicated. And uh, the loss of Luna 25 appears to have occurred during this crucial phase of changing the orbit into a polar orbit uh, ready for landing. Uh, we don't know exactly, but it looks like that's what happened. So it's not easy. But if everything goes well, this is the place on the moon in 20, late 2025 where NASA will land. And it's been chosen in close proximity to Shackleton Crater, which, as we saw, um, has got lots of water in it. So hopefully astronauts will descend on SpaceX's lunar starship uh, towards the moon's south pole and land on this sort of mountainous region here, which is called Malapert Massif. It's thought to be actually part of the rim of the Aitken Basin, that massive impact crater basin uh, that is mainly on the far side of the moon. But the Mount Malapert Massif is thought to be part of it. And hopefully in 2025, uh, this is where NASA will land. Assuming that everything goes well, they want, they want to get at the water. So uh, how do we actually extract ice and water from, uh, from the moon? Well, you've got a number of different options for getting it out. You can scoop it with a robotic arm, but it turns out that's not very efficient and certainly not energy efficient. Uh, you can uh, use a laser to vaporize the ice and then collect the water vapor. That, I think, would be a little bit tricky to do, but it's one option. You could use a heat exchanger to just melt the ice and collect the liquid water. And there are other methods they're looking at, including just straight drilling, something called electrodialysis, and uh, heating the, the ground with microwaves to release the water held up in it. But there are lots of people working on this. So by the time that uh, humans are ready to start mining the ice on the moon, then um, hopefully we'll have a good method of doing so. And lastly, talking about the race to the South Pole. Well, we've got all sorts of countries involved in this. India, of course, Chandrayaan 3 is going to land on Wednesday, all being well. Fingers crossed. Hope it goes well, India, because God knows you need a success. Uh, they're also looking forward to the future to uh, Chandrayaan 8. I don't know why the, um, um, the, uh, the, the numbering has, has changed so much, but it's scheduled to launch in 2025. And uh, like Chandrayaan 3, it will consist of an orbiter and a lander uh, and a rover. And uh, they're going to conduct a detailed study of the Lunar South Pole, including the search for water, ice, and other resources. The USA has got the Artemis project, and it's all mapped out, Artemis 2 an uncrewed uh, mission to fly round the moon, much like Apollo 8 did in the days of Apollo in 1968. Artemis 3 will be the first uh, mission to actually land people on the moon, the first woman and the first person of color. Uh, Artemis 4 is going to deliver the Lunar Gateway. This is a space station that's going to orbit the moon and be used as a staging post for future Artemis missions. Artemis 5, that's going to launch in 2027, and they're going to stay on the moon for a much longer period to carry out experiments and collect more samples. And we've got Artemis 6 in 2028, uh, delivering a habitat module to the gateway. Artemis 7 launching in 2029, where the astronauts will stay on the moon for even longer to, uh, to do valuable scientific work and collect and analyze more samples. 
China has got the Chang'e 7 mission scheduled to launch in 2026, 20, consisting of an orbiter, lander and rover, and a small flying detector. Not quite sure what it's going to be detecting, but I suspect it's ice. And again, it's exploring the lunar south pole for evidence of water, ice and other resources. Chang'e 8 in 2028. Uh, this is going to actually try to extract water from the lunar surface using what's called, and it's a whole well, acronym, ISRU, which stands for In Situ Resource Utilization. Why can't they just say mining, for God's sake? Because uh, that's what it is. Um, <laughs> Chang'e 9 uh, in 2030, and they're going to land astronauts, China's going to land astronauts on the moon near the lunar south pole. And beyond 2030, uh, China is uh, in partnership with Russia to develop the International Lunar Research Station, a permanent base at the South Pole of the Moon. And actually, there are uh, quite a few Western companies already helping China get this thing ready. So it's definitely a goer, although Russia's role in it is a bit in question now, especially after the Lunar 25 loss this week. Uh, so we'll have to see what happens there. And of course, we'll keep you posted. Um, others, Japan is planning to launch a mission to the Lunar South Pole in the 2020s. It's called SLIM. This is a much nicer acronym. Smart Lander for Investigating the Moon, which I like. That's <laughs> short and sweet and to the point. Uh, South Korea uh, are, are planning to launch a mission to the Lunar South Pole in the 2030s. Um, that's a little more of an unpronounceable acronym. It's KPLO, K -P -L -O, the Career Pathfinder Lunar Orbiter. Uh, UAE, the United Arab Emirates, is planning to launch a mission to the Lunar South Pole in the 2020s. That's called Hope Probe, because um, their, their Martian mission is also called Hope, of course. Uh, India and Japan have a plan to, to, um, to, to develop a mission called the Lunar Polar Exploration to explore the poles on the far side uh, at, that we can't see directly from the Earth, launching before 2026. So that's a nice international collaboration. Just a word about uh, legalities of all this. The Outer Space Treaty signed by uh, all spare sparing nations in 1967 specifically says outer space, including the moon and other celestial bodies, is not subject to national appropriation by claim of sovereignty, by means of use or occupation or by any other means. Basically, it means no country can claim all or part of the moon, that it's there for the benefit of all humans. So. Um, China, for example, couldn't set up a lunar base and then claim territory on the moon. Um, this has never, this, um, as Daz and I were saying earlier, this, this has never really been tested. It's still in force, the Outer Space Treaty, uh, but uh, whether it would actually work in a court of law now, or, or we don't know what would happen. If anybody's watched the fantastic TV sci-fi series for all mankind, uh, you get to find out what happens uh, when, when that situation arises. It's really good. Uh, highly recommended for all mankind. Really great sci-fi. So, uh, so there we are. Um, and that brings us, I think, to the end of, uh, of this little presentation about the, uh, about the Lunar South Pole. So as you can see, there's a lot going on there that's planned for the, for the future. And uh, it's gonna, the next few years are going to be really exciting. But I think you'd agree with me that mm. landscape looks mysterious and haunting, and you know I think the the visuals from yeah, the, I, 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 stunning. I, I really want. I'm look, looking forward to them getting down beneath, underneath the regolith to have a look at the actual um, uh, mantle itself because uh, this is the old um, surfaces, whereas all the previous landers have landed on the equator where you've got the Mari which is the new uh, surfaces, because it's all lava from impacts and uh, uh, such. Uh, this is the actual old, uh, the hopefully the original um, surface from when it actually formed, um, because it's, it has been described as the history book of the, um, the moon, because it's going to tell a story. Um, and this is why it's so heavily impacted. And of course, we've also got, as you, you mentioned, the backside. Again, that's just heavily cratered, and that seems to have no um, mare or no um, lava surfaces uh, like the, 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 the side closest to us. Mm. Is. So uh, I think it's going to be very, very interesting just to, the, the geology has got to be different somehow. Oh, yeah, definitely. Um, and 
Um, and I'm, I'm sort of like quite really looking forward to it. Um, just a, a matter of interest, um, maybe I'm being a bit thick here. When you were talking about the Chinese and you talk about Chengi 7, mm. you said a flying detector. Is that means it's going to be sort of like Orbiter, or is it because how are they going to fly anything on the um? Uh, this actually is a bit of a mystery because they mention it, but they don't specify what it is. So we'll have to wait. Yeah, yeah. Out, I'm afraid. I assume it's some sort of drone. Yeah. Um, you wouldn't call us. Yeah. You wouldn't call an orbiter a flying detector, probably. But so how do you have it as yeah. a drone? There's nothing for it to push against. Well, the moon. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's what I thought. Yeah. Well, uh, no, the moon has got an atmosphere. You just need you just need blades a hell of a lot bigger than the the, uh, the ingenuity ones on Mars. That's all. <laughs> But, well, yeah, but it'd have to be so light to be able to lift up, and also the little, the little granules, the glass beads you said that uh, got the water in, are they like the mini sort of like snow globes? Um, I don't know, possibly, possibly. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, I mean, and also to to extract this thing, it's going to be very um, oh, energy. Yeah, it um, yeah, it is. Is it going to be worth it, you know, sort of thing? So, yeah. I mean, it'd be if we could find some easy way to extract this water or to recover it, hmm. um, then it's going to be, um, you know, it, it's got to be a bonus because you've got when we do eventually set up bases and things like that, we are got, we have got to be some way self efficient. Uh, and hmm. one of the heaviest things that um, um, to actually carry on any mission is water. Yes. Mm. Um, so, you know, you've got to, I mean, I know on the International Space Station, they recycle it and they've got quite good at it now. Mm. Um, but, uh, yeah, you can't sort of like be carting, you know, gallons and gallons of water. Well, uh, I know everywhere. one person who is perfect for drilling on another surface. Don't. Don't. Don't, 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 don't even surface. go there. <laughs> no. I thought they can. If he can drill through a, a big rock in space, he can do it no problem on the moon. Yeah. I, oh, I, yeah. Say, I picture a drone not being powered by rotor blades, obviously, but by thrusters. Uh, so, um, so I was thinking along the same lines, but then you have a propulsion limit, right? Mm, true, true. But. Um, We'll have to wait and see, but they do. The Chinese do say a, a flying detector, which makes me think it's not. They're not yeah. referring to an orbiter. They must be referring to something else. Anyway, not to worry. Yeah, uh, because yeah, um, when, when you were talking about, sorry, when you were talking about going into orbit and before you can land on the poles, mm. you have to adjust your uh, orbit slowly and all that. Mm. Um, I thought this is what the gateway was supposed to do because it's going to have its own um, thrusters. And they're going to be ion thrusters, mm -hmm. um, and this is so they can move into the situation. So that will actually be doing the the manoeuvring, so that basically the astronauts are just going to um, just have to go straight down and straight back up again, rather than Absolutely. the thing. Um, um, just so uh, uh, you few of the comments. Um, yeah, sorry. So uh, Alan says some of the water on the moon may contain lithium rather than hydrogen. Uh, very true, but I think the consensus is now that the majority is is hydrogen and not not lithium. But um, you may be right, Alan. Um, so um, he also says that if there is at least a little atmosphere, they could use ionic propulsion for the for the drone. Not sure there would be enough because that that atmosphere is incredibly tenuous. Uh, it really, really is. But anyway, we can look into that and find that out. Um, yeah, somebody, a Facebook user says endless energy from the sun, focus and evaporate. That could be another way of doing it. Uh, like that, that incredible solar tower we've got in, in the south of Spain. Um, that's, that could be a, a but, but I think you would, that would be obviously focusing on a point source. And I think you need to be, you know, dealing with a lot more area at a time. Because otherwise, that's going to take a very long time. I don't know. I'm not an expert in these mm -hmm. things. I, and I don't claim to be. Yeah. Uh, fascinating. Yeah, I mean, Derek says. Oh, sorry. Uh, fascinating. Carry on, Andy. Sorry. So, uh, Derek says fascinating stuff, but sounds like the Klondike. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, so, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, but interesting. So, but be rest assured, lots of people are working 
on all of these these problems. So I think what we'll do next, yeah. week, I'll tell you next week about the specific challenges that these countries will face setting up permanent moon bases. So we'll have a chat about permanent moon bases next week, uh, just to follow. Yeah, because if I can just uh, with Derek's point about the Klondike, because mm. there is um, been detected in the leg uh, in the regolith a um, nuclear isotope, um, which when it's used to produce um energy or electricity and things like that is actually it produces no pollution um it's clean um and they reckon that there's probably enough there to last i think it was hundreds of years mm -hmm. of producing electricity so this is the sort of thing that people are going to be going after um and i did notice you put somewhere that um all the countries that at the time signed up to the 1967 yeah they did um it's, it's, agreement you know, which they did have, you didn't have countries like india and the uae signing up to it because they weren't yeah. in space in 1967 but whichever exactly it, um and it's it, yeah. really uh mostly i guess uh, um america and russia who else was in space in yeah. 1967 china were i think weren't they they were doing some 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 small stuff in space i, I think we so we signed up to it there's anyone yes. who had a sort of like a, 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 a any interest in space at all yeah that's right um and as you said it hasn't really been tested um uh but there have been and as we were talking earlier there have been um agreements that have been thought up and produced to um uh, to make this better mm. but a lot of countries would, weren't interested in signing them but of course we've now got the artemis accord and there's lots of countries now even countries you wouldn't even think of had it were too small to have a space well, agency they're all signing up, up. Steve looks it up. he says 113 countries have signed the treaty since thank you very much for doing that steve okay Interesting. Yeah, that's so, good. You know, ah here we are lithium that's i thought it was lithium h3 yeah. used in fusion um but i didn't i didn't want to look stupid if i said the wrong thing um, but yeah, there's apparently there's quite an abundance of this material uh, in the regolith, mm. and they think this is what pe one of the things that people will be going after. Mm. Um, but uh, yeah, it's it's, it's going to be. But like I said, I, I want to see what this um, the surface at the south at the south pole is actually what the makeup of it is, and yeah. Um, yeah. it'll be very very interesting. Have you um, have you watched For Mankind, Daz? Anybody here watched it, Roger? No. 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 no, it rings a bell, but I'm not sure where it might have been. Oh, I'll have to. I don't I'll know. To I, it doesn't ring a bell. It, it, I've been it. wanting to, but I just have not had a chance. No. It, it looks incredible. It, it is incredible, and the new season is just about to start. Uh, so, um, I, and I just, I just fell in love with it because uh, viewers, if you don't know for mankind, I keep plugging it because I think everybody here would enjoy it. Everybody who watches space auditors would enjoy it. It posits an alternative history. It starts off the day that the Russians beat the Americans to the moon and how that affects the American space program going forward and what happens. And um, it's it's absolutely amazing. Absolutely amazing. So and where will we find it, Andy? Um, I will. Um, Apple I will, TV. I will sort that out for you. It's Apple TV. Oh, yeah. Apple. Yeah. 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 Graham yeah. Turvey has seen it. He yeah, loves it. Yeah. Yeah. Did, yeah. did you enjoy it? Yeah. Graham says he loved it. Yeah. yeah, there's a new season. And Alan, yeah, Alan says um, it's a, a what if the Russians had landed first. That's right. Um, and I was telling you the story, wasn't I, a little bit earlier on, Andy, about Zond Five. Yes. Uh, because the, and it was in nineteen uh, in sixteen a uh, sixteen in nineteen sixty eight they sent uh, the Zond Five um, capsule to circumnavigate the moon, and on board was the very. Because we were talking earlier about the achievements of the Russian space industry, and they've got a list of first as long as your arm. Um, and one of them was Zond 5, because they sent the first terrestrial um, creatures to circumnavigate the um, the moon. Mm. And the, the fact that the two big animals that were on there were actually horse field tortoises. Um, which they unfortunately starved on the way up there. I was reading about it earlier on. But what the Russians did, because they'd basically given up their race to the moon, because they realised you know, they, they, they weren't achieving what they wanted to do so fact, quick enough, um, 
is that uh, three uh, of the cosmonauts thought they'd play a bit of a joke on um, the, the Americans. And what they did is because the uh, capsules in those days were all controlled from ground control, because there's no one to pull the levers in these capsules because it's all lichens, um, insects and uh, tortoises who probably slept all the way there and slept all the way back. Um, they rigged up the, um, uh, uh, the, the radio, not only to receive, but also transmit. And when they actually got to the moon, they actually played a, a joke on the, the Western um, world by broadcasting to the capsule, which is then relayed back to Earth. And they were going through the procedures as if they were going to land on the moon. <laughs> and, uh, of course, it was picked up at Jodrell Bank. Uh, also, the CIA picked it up. And the first thing that um, I think it was Alan Borman um, at NASA knew was that he was getting a phone call from the president of the USA saying, why am I hearing the Russians about to land on the moon? <laughs> um, and uh, they, uh, it, it was it, it sort of like set up a bit of a stir because the Americans at first thought that they uh, had lost the race to the moon. Yeah. Um, and then a few it's months later, crazy. Borman actually went to Russia yeah, and he, he gave them a telling off calling them space hooligans. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, but it was all a big joke. So, yeah. yeah. There we are. All right, then. Well, I think that just about brings us to the end of uh, tonight's show. Thank you all for being here so much. We do appreciate you being here as ever. And uh, just um, that's it, really. A big thank you to our sponsor, Robert Valley Optics. And uh, we've got some uh, more fantastic stuff lined up for you next week. Don't so, forget Wednesday. Uh, Sorry, and Wednesday, yes, of course. So don't forget, we are we are going to be going live on Wednesday to uh, to cover the um, uh, the live the live landing of India's Chandrayaan three space uh, spacecraft on the moon, and uh, we should, we're really looking forward to that. So we hope you can join us on Wednesday. I'll create the live stream probably tomorrow. So keep an eye on our channel, and you'll see exactly what. What, uh, what time it's time for. We'll have to work out exactly when we want to do it. Uh, but uh, keep an eye on the channel, and we hope to see you if you can make it on Wednesday for the uh, the landing of Chandrayaan 3 on the moon. Really exciting day. Okay, so I'd like to say a yeah. big thank you to yeah. Kareem um, for his wonderful presentation about the... the, the yeah, Earth. people have missed you, and they've said in the chat that it's nice to see you back. Yeah, it is nice I've to missed, have you back. I've and, missed being on the panel. It's good to be here. Yeah, it's good, good to see you again. So uh, don't be yeah, it's nice to have you back. Yeah. And good luck with your new students. Thank so, you. So uh, let's see what happens there. Um, and uh, thank you, Roger, as always, for um, for uh, being the surrogate Rachel and uh, stepping in <laughs> to do the gallery, as well as your wonderful uh, account of what's going on in the night sky. So uh, you. I can, you can see the resemblance, really. So, so there we are. So... Uh, we will see you um, same time next week, viewers, if not on Wednesday. If we don't see you on Wednesday, we'll be back on Monday, same time. And I must apologize that my uh, my video and audio are still not synchronized. Um, I've got tech people working on this, but they haven't found a solution yet. It's really weird. So I apologize that there's a bit of a lag on my video. Yeah. Um, As he means by tech people, it's a man with a hammer. It's a man with a big hammer, yes. Uh, and, and, and a bucket of blue sparks. And, uh, and there we are. Yeah. All right, then, viewers, thank you. If so in date, give it a yeah. type. Yeah, <laughs> we do appreciate it. For more of us at Space Oddities, have a fantastic week. Stay safe, look after each other, and we'll see you very soon. Yeah. And we hope to see you on Wednesday.